Our Heavenly Father, we know that those words we just read are not merely human words, but the very words of God. And so we pray now that by your Spirit, you would enable me to preach your word faithfully. And may your Holy Spirit bring your word to bear on our hearts with full power and conviction that we might live for your glory alone in sacrificial love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what pastor or leader has had the greatest impact on your Christian growth? What pastor or leader has had the greatest impact on your Christian growth? Now, one person who impacted my life was uh, my youth pastor, Lee. And as a teenager, he took me under his wing. He taught me the gospel. He modelled a life of joyful Christian service. And under him I was confirmed and I gave my testimony for the very first time. Uh, Later I had a mentor named Matthew. He was a faithful Bible teacher in a prominent ministry position. But as great as his Bible teaching was, it was his character that I still remember the most. His humility, his prayerfulness his hospitality, his heart for the nations, his love for the lost. Well, what pastor or leader has had the greatest impact on your Christian growth? Whoever it was, whether it was a parent or a Sunday school teacher or a youth group leader or a pastor, uh, I would not be surprised if your experience was like mine, that what impacted you the most was not what they taught, but who they were. Not that their teaching was unimportant, because God's life-transforming word never goes out empty, but it was their life, their love, their character that made their, their ministry so impactful. See, authentic gospel ministry that powerfully impacts lives is so often a ministry where what is preached is lived. Well, that's what we see today from our passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in this short passage, we're given a glimpse into the life of the Apostle Paul. We glimpse how he lived among those that he ministered to. Now, the church in Thessalonica was planted by Paul during his second missionary journey, which we can read of in Acts 17. Uh, He stayed there only a short time because he was driven out by persecution. But Paul's visit had a deep and lasting impact on the church. And still concerned for the church, Paul writes this deeply personal letter to them to encourage them on in their faith so that when persecution or temptation comes, they won't waver. He wants to remind them in this passage of his authentic Christian life, which authenticated the message he preached to them. Well, what was that life Paul lived? Firstly, we see that faithful gospel ministers persevere, not give up. Faithful gospel ministers persevere, not give up. We read in verse 1, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we'd already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Suffering is often a very good litmus test of how genuine our Christian faith really is. If you suffer for being a Christian but you persevere, then it shows that your faith is genuine. And the same with ministry. If you suffer in ministry but you persevere, It shows that your ministry is genuine, that you weren't simply in it for personal gain. And that was Paul's example. He reminds them of the persecution he faced at Philippi. Acts 16 records how Paul was attacked by a mob and then he was beaten and then he was thrown into prison. But he didn't give up. His next stop was Thessalonica, where another mob of Jews caused an uproar in the city and dragged Paul to the city authorities. Paul was driven out again. He went on to Berea, where he still persevered in proclaiming the gospel, despite the persecution that followed him once again. 
The Thessalonians knew all this. They were well acquainted with Paul's suffering and his perseverance in the face of it. And he reminds them that that all his suffering was not in vain. The Thessalonian church was planted and it endured, despite all the suffering that they faced as well. Well, what about us this morning? Perhaps right now you are suffering as a leader of God's people. And you're tempted right now to throw in the towel, to give up, because it's all just too difficult. It's always the easier option to give in. But though Paul suffered and was shamefully treated, he did not give up proclaiming Christ boldly. He persevered. Faithful gospel ministers persevere, not give up. Well, secondly, we see that faithful gospel ministers please God, not people. Faithful gospel ministers please God, not people. See, the fact that Paul persevered in his ministry, even though it cost him so much, revealed what his true motives were. Have a look at verse 3. He says, For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. See, there's always a temptation in ministry to seek to please people instead of God, to tell people what they want to hear instead of the truth that they need to hear. Because, let's face it, none of us likes conflict. And sometimes the truth is very hard to speak because we know it will not be well received. And so if anyone wants to avoid suffering for Christ, they'll be a people pleaser. They will say and they will do what everyone wants to keep them happy. But that was not the Apostle Paul. He was not a people pleaser. He didn't simply tell people what they wanted to hear so that they would treat him well in return. Paul played to the audience of one. What mattered most to Paul was pleasing the God to whom he was one day give account. Paul sought to please God, not people. And so Paul was willing to say the hard things. He was willing to preach about sin and the judgment of God. He was bold to tell them to turn away from their idols and serve the living and true God. And he didn't give up proclaiming the truth, even when it was rejected even when he was shamefully treated. Paul was a model gospel minister. He preached the truth with pure motives to please God alone. Well, what about us? It's worth pausing to think. Why did I volunteer as a leader in the church? Why am I serving in that ministry? Whose approval matters the most to me? Am I serving because I want to please God or because I want to please people? Am I serving with pure motives for the glory of God or for personal gain? If our motives are right, we we won't give up when the going gets tough because we were never doing it for ourselves in the first place. We were doing it for God and therefore the personal cost will not diminish our will to continue. Well, Paul goes on in verse 5. He says, For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. In the ancient world, it was common for speakers to travel from town to town, collecting payment from those that they spoke to. So a visiting speaker was often motivated more by money than the truth. They would tailor their message uh, to their audience to elicit a more favorable response and therefore to make more money. Now, some church leaders do that today. They tailored their message to make it more acceptable to the hearers. 
And, and so they will speak of God's love, but not his judgment. They will promise God's blessing, but not suffering. They will endorse a sinful lifestyle rather than calling people to repent of it. And a pastor who preaches what people want to hear can very quickly grow a church and make a lot of money. Sadly, many church leaders have fallen for that. But that was not the Apostle Paul. See, even though he was an apostle, even though he had every right to ask those he served to support him financially, he didn't ask for money. He worked with his own hands to support his needs so that he might make his, his uh, true motives abundantly clear. That he was motivated not by greed, but by the glory of God. Well, again, we ought to examine our own hearts. Are we tempted to soften our message because we want people to like us? Do we refrain from talking about sin and God's judgment and speak only of his love? Do we do ministry for personal benefit or for the praise of God? Faithful gospel ministers please God, not people. Well, finally, we see that faithful gospel ministers pursue love, not power. Faithful gospel ministers pursue love, not power. Uh, in verse 6, Paul reminds them that he had rightful authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ to make certain demands of them. He could command their obedience. He could demand their allegiance. But even though Paul possessed legitimate authority as a leader of God's people, he was he was not interested in power. Instead, he pursued love. Look at uh, verse end of verse 6. He said, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her children. Now, literally, we were infants among you. We were small, we were humble, we were gentle, like a nursing mother. Now, anyone who has been a mother or observed a mother knows what a noble ministry that is. Mothers model sacrificial service among us as they sacrifice everything for their children, their sleep, their food, their time. They deserve our highest esteem. And that is how Paul ministered to the Thessalonian church. He loved them and he nurtured them sacrificially, like a mother nursing her children. See, that is how a Christian leader ought to be, giving up their time, their comfort, their convenience to the costly service of others. See, Christian ministry is not about titles or positions of influence, or power, or compensation. It's about service. It's about humility. It's about love. Now, after all, we serve a Lord who sacrificed everything for us. Remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10. He said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, our Lord, possessed all authority in heaven and earth. At his word, the sick were healed. Demons were driven out. Storms were stilled. The dead were raised. Legions of angels celebrated his birth. And at any point, he could have commanded them to serve his needs. But the Lord Jesus Christ had no interest in power or position. He humbled himself to a manger as he took on human flesh. He humbled himself to accept the rejection 
of the crowds, he humbled himself to death upon a cross. The Lord of all gave his life for sinners. He took our sins in our place. He took the judgment that we deserved. So full he was of sacrificial love. See, that is what Christian ministry is about. It is about overwhelming, sacrificial love. And, and that is what the Apostle Paul imitated so well. Look how he finishes in verse 8. He says, uh, being affectionately desirous of you, uh, the NIV says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And Paul was no professional, uh, standing aloof at the front, disconnected from the people that he was ministering to. He was intimately involved in their lives. He shared not only the gospel of God, but his life as well. And he demonstrated real love. And so if you are in a position of church leadership, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a youth group leader or a lay reader or member of the parish council or you're a pastor or whatever your position may be, remember, what matters most is not just your teaching, but your life, your love. For in the end, it is your character that will be remembered and make the greatest impact. For my mentor, Matthew, I struggle to remember any of the sermons that he taught. Hope he's not listening in, right? Not because they were bad, but because what I remember the most is his life, his love. People will rarely listen to what you say unless they first know that you love them. But if you do love them, the gospel message you preach will be authenticated as genuine and you will have a deep and lasting impact. And so if we are Christian leaders, do you love the people that you serve as a mother loves her children? Faithful gospel ministers persevere, not give up. Faithful gospel ministers please God, not people. Faithful gospel ministers pursue love, not power. So let us pray for our leaders that they will live such a life of authentic ministry. And as we choose leaders, let us recruit people who demonstrate this kind of character. And if we are leaders in the church, let us strive to follow Paul's example of authentic Christian ministry as he imitated Jesus Christ. Of course, there are going to be many times when we fail and when we fall short. Uh, we are all sinners after all, uh, including leaders. And, and in those times when we feel inadequate or, or broken or we feel disappointed and let down, we need to look again to the perfect leader, to Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us. We need to remember the full forgiveness that he offers to sinners. We need to remember the unconditional love that he has, which is not dependent on our performance in ministry. And overwhelmed by the love of God and the grace of God shown at the cross, we'll be strengthened to love our leaders, imperfect as they may be, and will be strengthened to strive to be the leaders Christ wants us to be. Leaders who persevere in serving Jesus through tough times. Leaders who seek God's glory, not praise from people. Leaders who love deeply the people that they serve. Well, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who humbly laid down his life for us on the cross. We thank you for the Apostle Paul, who 
imitated Christ in his ministry of sacrificial service. And we want to pray for our leaders that you would strengthen them, that you would strengthen me to live such a life of authentic ministry. Would you remind us of your grace when we fail? And would you enable us all to persevere in loving service of one another, seeking your glory alone? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.